an honest farmer had once a donkey that had been a faithful servant to him a great many years but was now growing old and every day more and more unfit for work his master therefore was tired of keeping him and began to think of putting an end to him but the donkey who saw that some mischief was in the wind took himself slyly off and began his journey towards the great city for there thought he i may turn musician after he had travelled a little way he spied a dog lying by the roadside and panting as if he were tired what makes you pant so my friend said the donkey alas said the dog my master was going to knock me on the head because i am old and weak and can no longer make myself useful to him in hunting so i ran away but what can i do to earn my livelihood hark ye said the donkey i am going to the great city to turn musician suppose you go with me and try what you can do in the same way the dog said he was willing and they jogged on together they had not gone far before they saw a cat sitting in the middle of the road and making a most rueful face pray my good lady said the donkey what's the matter with you you look quite out of spirits ah me said the cat how can one be in good spirits when one's life is in danger because i am beginning to grow old and had rather lie at my ease by the fire than run about the house after the mice my mistress laid hold of me and was going to drown me and though i have been lucky enough to get away from her i do not know what i am to live upon oh said the donkey by all means go with us to the great city you are a great night singer and may make your fortune as a musician the cat was pleased with the thought and joined the party soon afterwards as they were passing by a farmyard they saw a rooster perched upon a gate and screaming out with all his might and main bravo said the donkey upon my word you make a famous noise pray what is all this about why said the rooster i was just now saying that we should have fine weather for our washing day and yet my mistress and the cook don't thank me for my pains but threaten to cut off my head to-morrow and make breath of me for the guests that are coming on sunday heaven forbid said the donkey come with us master chanticleer it will be better at any rate than staying here to have your head cut off besides who knows if we care to sing in tune we may get up some kind of a concert so come along with us with all my heart said the rooster so they all four went on jollily together they could not however reach the great city the first day so when night came on they went into a wood to sleep the donkey and the dog laid themselves down under a great tree and the cat climbed up into the branches while the rooster thinking that the higher he sat the safer he should be flew up to the very top of the trees and then according to his custom before he went to sleep looked out on all sides of him to see that everything was well in doing this he saw afar off something bright and shining and calling to his companions said there must be a house no great way off for i see a light if that be the case said the donkey we had better change our quarters for our lodging is not the best in the world besides added the dog i should not be the worse for a bone or two or a bit of meat so they walked off together towards the spot where chanticleer had seen the light and as they drew near it became larger and brighter till they at last came close to a house in which a gang of robbers lived the donkey being the tallest of the company perched up to the window and peeped in well donkey said chanticleer what do you see 
"'What do I see?' replied the donkey. "'Why, I see a table spread with all kinds of good things, and robbers sitting round it making merry.' "'That would be a noble lodging for us,' said the rooster. "'Yes,' said the donkey, "'if we could only get in.' So they consulted together how they should contrive to get the robbers out, and at last they hit upon a plan. The donkey placed himself upright on his hind legs, with his four feet resting against the window. The dog got upon his back. The cat scrambled up to the dog's shoulders, and the rooster flew up and sat upon the cat's head. When all was ready, a signal was given, and they began their music. The donkey brayed, the dog barked, the cat mewed, and the rooster screamed. And then they all broke through the window at once, and came tumbling into the room, amongst the broken glass, with a most hideous clatter. The robbers, who had been not a little frightened by the opening concert, had now no doubt that some frightful hobgoblin had broken in upon them, and scampered away as fast as they could. The coast once clear, our traveller soon sat down, and dispatched what the robbers had left, with as much eagerness as if they had not expected to eat again for a month. As soon as they had satisfied themselves, they put out the lights, and each once more sought out a resting place to his own liking. The donkey laid himself down upon a heap of straw in the yard, the dog stretched himself upon a mat behind the door, the cat rolled herself up on the hearth before the warm ashes, and the rooster perched upon a beam on the top of the house, and as they were all rather tired with their journey, they soon fell asleep. But about midnight, when the robbers saw from afar that the lights were out, and that all seemed quiet, they began to think that they had been in too great a hurry to run away, and one of them, who was bolder than the rest, went to see what was going on. Finding everything still, he marched into the kitchen, and groped about till he found a match in order to light a candle, and then, espying the glittering fiery eyes of the cat, he mistook them for live coals, and held the match to them to light it. But the cat, not understanding his joke, sprang at his face, and spat and scratched at him. This frightened him dreadfully, and away he ran to the back door. But there the dog jumped up and bit him in the leg, and as he was crossing over the yard the donkey kicked him, and the rooster, who had been awakened by the noise, crowed with all his might. At this the robber ran back as fast as he could to his comrades and told the captain how a horrid witch had got him into the house, and had spat at him, and scratched his face with her long bony fingers, how a man with a knife in his hand had hidden himself behind the door, and stabbed him in the leg, how a black monster stood in the yard, and struck him with a club, and how the devil had sat upon the top of the house, and cried out, "'Throw the rascal up here!' After this the robbers never dared to go back to the house, but the musicians were so pleased with their quarters that they took up their abode there, and there they are, I dare say, at this very day. End of the Travelling Musician Once in summer time the bear and the wolf were walking in the forest, and the bear heard a bird singing so beautifully that he said, Brother wolf, what bird is it that sings so well? That is the king of birds, said the wolf, before whom we must bow down. In reality the bird was the willow wren. If that's the case, said the bear, I should very much like to see his royal palace. Come, take me thither. That is not done quite as you seem to think, said the wolf. You must wait until the queen comes. Soon afterwards the queen arrived with some food in her beak, and the lord king came too, and they began to feed their young ones. 
The bear would have liked to go at once, but the wolf held him back by the sleeve, and said, No, you must wait until the lord and lady queen have gone away again. So they took stock of the hole where the nest lay, and trotted away. The bear, however, could not rest until he had seen the royal palace, and when a short time had passed, went to it again. The king and queen had just flown out, so he peeped in, and saw five or six young ones lying there. "'Is that the royal palace?' cried the bear. "'It is a wretched palace, and you are not king's children. You are disreputable children.' When the young wrens heard that, they were frightfully angry, and screamed, "'No, that we are not. Our parents are honest people. Bear, you will have to pay for that." The bear and the wolf grew uneasy, and turned back and went into their holes. The young willow wrens, however, continued to cry and scream, and when their parents again brought food, they said, "'We will not so much as touch one fly's leg. No, not if we were dying of hunger, until you have settled whether we are respectable children or not. The bear has been here, and has insulted us." Then the old king said, "'Be easy. He shall be punished.' And he at once flew with the queen to the bear's cave, and called in, "'Old growler, why have you insulted my children? You shall suffer for it. We will punish you by a bloody war.' Thus war was announced to the bear and all four-footed animals were summoned to take part in it. Oxen, donkeys, cows, deer, and every other animal the earth contained. And the willow wren summoned everything which flew in the air, not only birds, large and small, but midges and hornets, bees and flies had to come. When the time came for the war to begin, the willow wren sent out spies to discover who was the enemy's commander-in-chief. The gnat, who was the most crafty, flew into the forest where the enemy was assembled, and hid herself beneath a leaf of the tree where the password was to be announced. There stood the bear, and he called the fox before him, and said, "'Fox, you are the most cunning of all animals. You shall be general, and lead us.' "'Good,' said the fox. "'But what signal shall we agree upon?' "'No one knew that.' So the fox said, "'I have a fine, long, bushy tail, which almost looks like a plume of red feathers. When I lift my tail up quite high, all is going well, and you must charge. But if I let it hang down, run away as fast as you can.' When the gnat had heard that, she flew away again, and revealed everything, down to the minutest detail, to the willow wren. When day broke, and the battle was to begin, all the four-footed animals came running up with such a noise that the earth trembled. The willow wren, with his army, also came flying through the air with such a humming and whirring and swarming that everyone was uneasy and afraid, and on both sides they advanced against each other. But the willow wren set down the hornet with orders to settle beneath the fox's tail and sting with all his might. When the fox felt the first sting, he started so that he lifted one leg from pain, but he bore it, and still kept his tail high in the air. At the second sting he was forced to put it down for a moment. At the third he could hold out no longer, screamed, and put his tail between his legs. When the animals saw that, they thought all was lost and began to flee each into his hole, and the birds had won the battle. Then the king and queen flew home to their children, and cried, "'Children, rejoice! Eat and drink to your heart's content! We have won the battle!' But the young wrens said, "'We will not eat yet. The bear must come to the nest and beg for pardon.' and say that we are honourable children before we will do that." Then the willow wren flew to the bear's hole, and cried, "'Growler, you are to come to the nest to my children, and beg their pardon, or else every rib of your body shall be broken.' 
So the bear crept thither in the greatest fear, and begged their pardon. And now, at last, the young wrens were satisfied, and sat down together, and ate and drank and made merry, till quite late into the night. End of the Willow Wren and the Bear The nuts are quite ripe now, said Chanticleer to his wife, Partlet. Suppose we go together to the mountains, and eat as many as we can, before the squirrel takes them all away. With all my heart, said Partlet, let us go and make a holiday of it together. So they went to the mountains, and, as it was a lovely day, they stayed there till the evening. Now, whether it was that they had eaten so many nuts that they could not walk, or whether they were lazy and would not, I do not know. However, they took it into their heads that it did not become them to go home on foot. So Chanticleer began to build a little carriage of nutshells, and when it was finished Partlet jumped into it and sat down, and bid Chanticleer harness himself to it and draw her home. "'That's a good joke,' said Chanticleer. "'No, that will never do. I would rather by half walk home. I'll sit on the box and be coachman, if you like, but I'll not draw.' While this was passing, a duck came quacking up, and cried out, "'You thieving vagabonds! What business have you in my grounds? I give it you well for your insolence.' and upon that she fell upon Chanticleer most lustily. But Chanticleer was no coward, and returned the duck's blows with his sharp spurs so fiercely that she soon began to cry out for mercy, which was only granted to her upon condition that she would draw the carriage home for them. This she agreed to do, and Chanticleer got upon the box and drove, crying, now, duck, get on as fast as you can. And away they went, at a pretty good pace. After they had travelled along a little way, they met a needle and a pin walking together along the road, and the needle cried out, Stop! Stop! and said it was so dark that they could hardly find their way, and such dirty walking they could not get on at all. He told them that he and his friend the pin had been at a public house a few miles off and had sat drinking till they had forgotten how late it was. He begged, therefore, that the travellers would be so kind as to give them a lift in their carriage. Chanticleer, observing that they were but thin fellows and not likely to take up much room, told them they might ride, but made them promise not to dirty the wheels of the carriage in getting in nor to tread upon Partlet's toes. Late at night they arrived at an inn, and as it was bad travelling in the dark, and the duck seemed much tired and waddled about a good deal from one side to the other, they made up their minds to fix their quarters there. But the landlord at first was unwilling, and said his house was full, thinking they might not be very respectable company. However, they spoke civilly to him, and gave him the egg which Partlet had laid by the way, and said they would give him the duck, who was in the habit of laying one every day. So at last he let them come in, and they bespoke a handsome supper, and spent the evening very jollily. Early in the morning, before it was quite light, and when nobody was stirring in the inn, Chanticleer awakened his wife and, fetching the egg, they pecked a hole in it, ate it up, and threw the shells into the fireplace. They then went to the pin and needle, who were fast asleep, and, seizing them by the heads, stuck one into the landlord's easy-chair, and the other into his handkerchief, and, having done this, they crept away as softly as possible. However, the duck, who slept in the open air in the yard, heard them coming, and, jumping into the brook which ran close by the inn, soon swam out of their reef. An hour or two afterwards the landlord got up and took his handkerchief to wipe his face, but the pin ran into him and pricked him. Then he walked into the kitchen to light his pipe at the fire, 
but when he stirred it up the eggshells flew into his eyes and almost blinded him bless me said he all the world seems to have a design against my head this morning and so saying he threw himself sulkily into his easy chair but oh dear the needle ran into him and this time the pain was not in his head he now flew into a very great passion and suspecting the company who had come in the night before he went to look after them but they were all off so he swore that he never again would take in such a troop of vagabonds who ate a great deal paid no reckoning and gave him nothing for his trouble but their apish tricks two how chanticleer and partlet went to visit mr corbus another day chanticleer and partlet wished to ride out together so chanticleer built a handsome carriage with four red wheels and harnessed six mice to it and then he and partlet got into the carriage and away they drove soon afterwards a cat met them and said where are you going and chanticleer replied all on our way a visit to pay to mr corbus the fox to-day then the cat said take me with you chanticleer said with all my heart get up behind and be sure you do not fall off take care of this handsome coach of mine nor dirty my pretty red wheels so fine now mice be ready and wheels run steady for we are going a visit to pay to mr corbus the fox to-day soon after came up a millstone an egg a duck and a pin and chanticleer gave them all leave to get into the carriage and go with them when they arrived at mr corbus's house he was not at home so the mice drew the carriage into the coach-house chanticleer and partlet flew upon a beam the cat sat down in the fireplace the duck got into the washing cistern the pin stuck himself into the red pillow the millstone laid himself over the house door and the egg rolled himself up in the towel when mr corbus came home he went to the fireplace to make a fire but the cat threw all the ashes in his eyes so he ran to the kitchen to wash himself but there the duck splashed all the water in his face and when he tried to wipe himself the egg broke to pieces in the towel all over his face and eyes then he was very angry and went without his supper to bed but when he laid his head on the pillow the pin ran into his cheek at this he became quite furious and jumping up would have run out of the house but when he came to the door the millstone fell down on his head and killed him on the spot three how partlet died and was buried and how chanticleer died of grief another day chanticleer and partlet agreed to go again to the mountains to eat nuts and it was settled that all the nuts which they found should be shared equally between them now partlet found a very large nut but she said nothing about it to chanticleer and kept it all to herself however it was so big that she could not swallow it and it stuck in her throat then she was in a great fright and cried out to chanticleer pray run as fast as you can and fetch me some water or i shall be choked chanticleer ran as fast as he could to the river and said river give me some water for partlet lies in the mountain and will be choked by a great nut the river said run first to the bride and ask her for a silken cord to draw up the water chanticleer ran to the bride and said bride you must give me a silken cord for then the river will give me water and the water i will give to partlet who lies on the mountain and will be choked by a great nut but the bride said run first and bring me my garland that is hanging on a willow in the garden then chanticleer ran to the garden and took the garland from the bough where it hung and brought it to the bride and then the bride gave him the silken cord and he took the silken cord of the river and the river gave him water and he carried the water to partlet 
but in the meantime she was choked by the great nut and lay quite dead and never moved any more then chanticleer was very sorry and cried bitterly and all the beasts came and wept with him over poor bartlett and six mice built a little hearse to carry her to her grave and when it was ready they harnessed themselves before it and chanticleer drove them on the way they met the fox where are you going chanticleer said he to bury my partlet said the other may i go with you said the fox yes but you must get up behind or my horses will not be able to draw you then the fox got up behind and presently the wolf the bear the goat and all the beasts of the wood came and climbed upon the hearse so on they went till they came to a rapid stream how shall we get over said chanticleer then said a straw i will lay myself across and you may pass over upon me but as the mice were going over the straw slipped away and fell into the water and the six mice all fell in and were drowned what was to be done then a large log of wood came and said oh, i am big enough i will lay myself across the stream and you shall pass over upon me so he laid himself down but they managed so clumsily that the log of wood fell in and was carried away by the stream then a stone who saw what had happened came up and kindly offered to help poor chanticleer by laying himself across the stream and this time he got safely to the other side with the hearse and managed to get partlet out of it but the fox and the other mourners who were sitting behind were too heavy and fell back into the water and were all carried away by the stream and drowned thus chanticleer was left alone with his dead partner and having dug a grave for her he laid her in it and made a little hillock over her then he sat down by the grave and wept and mourned till at last he died too and so all were dead End of the Adventures of Chanticleer and Partner A poor woodman sat in his cottage one night, smoking his pipe by the fireside, while his wife sat by his side, spinning. "'How lonely it is, wife,' said he, as he puffed out a long curl of smoke, "'for you and me to sit here by ourselves, without any children to play about and amuse us while other people seem so happy and merry with their children. "'What you say is very true,' said the wife, sighing and turning round her wheel. "'How happy should I be if I had but one child! If it were ever so small, yea, if it were no bigger than my thumb, I should be very happy and love it dearly. Now, odd as you may think it, it came to pass that this good woman's wish was fulfilled just in the very way she had wished it for not long afterwards she had a little boy who was quite healthy and strong but was not much bigger than my thumb so they said well we cannot say we have not got what we wished for and little as he is we will love him dearly and they called him thomas thumb they gave him plenty of food, yet for all they could do he never grew bigger, but kept just the same size as he had been when he was born. Still his eyes were sharp and sparkling, and he soon showed himself to be a clever little fellow who always knew well what he was about. One day, as the woodman was getting ready to go into the wood to cut fuel, he said, "'I wish I had someone to bring the cart after me, for I want to make haste.' "'Oh, father!' cried tom i will take care of that the cart shall be in the wood by the time you want it then the woodman laughed and said oh, how can that be you cannot reach up to the horse's bridle never mind that father said tom if my mother will only harness the horse i will get into his ear and tell him which way to go 
Well, said the father, we will try for once. When the time came, the mother harnessed the horse to the cart and put Tom into his ear. And as he sat there, the little man told the beast how to go, crying out, Go on! and stop! as he wanted. And thus the horse went on just as well as if the woodman had driven it himself into the wood. It happened that as the horse was going a little too fast, and Tom was calling out, Gently! Gently! Two strangers came up. "'What an odd thing that is,' said one. "'There is a cart going along, and I hear a carter talking to the horse, but yet I can see no one.' "'That is queer indeed,' said the other. "'Let us follow the cart and see where it goes.' So they went on into the wood, till at last they came to the place where the woodman was. Then Tom Thumb, seeing his father, cried out, See, father, here I am with the cart, all right and safe. Now take me down. So his father took hold of the horse with one hand, and with the other took his son out of the horse's ear, and put him down upon a straw, where he sat as merry as you please. The two strangers were all this time looking on, and did not know what to say for wonder. At last one took the other aside, and said, that little urchin will make our fortune, if we can get him and carry him about from town to town as a show. We must buy him. So they went up to the woodman and asked him what he would take for the little man. He will be better off, said they, with us than with you. I won't sell him at all, said the father. My own flesh and blood is dearer to me than all the silver and gold in the world. But Tom, hearing of the bargain they wanted to make, crept up his father's coat to his shoulder, and whispered in his ear, "'Take the money, father, and let them have me. I'll soon come back to you.' So the woodman at last said he would sell Tom to the strangers for a large piece of gold, and they paid the price. "'Where would you like to sit?' said one of them. "'Oh, put me on the rim of your hat.' That will be a nice gallery for me. I can walk about there and see the country as we go along." So they did as he wished, and when Tom had taken leave of his father, they took him away with them. They journeyed on till it began to be dusky, and then the little man said, "'Let me get down. I'm tired.' So the man took off his hat and put him down on a clod of earth in a ploughed field by the side of the road. But Tom ran about amongst the furrows, and at last slipped into an old mouse-hole. "'Good night, my masters,' said he. "'I'm off. Mind and look sharp after me the next time.' Then they ran at once to the place and poked the ends of their sticks into the mouse-hole, but all in vain. Tom only crawled farther and farther in, and at last it became quite dark so that they were forced to go their way without their prize, as sulky as could be. When Tom found they were gone, he came out of his hiding-place. "'What dangerous walking it is,' said he, "'in this ploughed field. If I were to fall from one of these great clods, I should undoubtedly break my neck.' At last, by good luck, he found a large empty snail-shell. "'This is lucky,' said he. "'I can sleep here very well.' And in he crept. Just as he was falling asleep, he heard two men passing by, chatting together, and one said to the other, "'How can we rob that rich parson's house of his silver and gold?' "'I'll tell you,' cried Tom. "'What noise was that?' said the thief, frightened. "'I'm sure I heard someone speak.' They stood listening, and Tom said, "'Take me with you, and I'll soon show you how to get the parson's money. But oh, where are you?' said they. "'Look about on the ground,' answered he, "'and listen where the sound comes from.' At last the thieves found him out, and lifted him up in their hands. "'You little urchin,' they said, "'what can you do for us?' "'Why?' 
I can get between the iron window bars of the parson's house and throw you out whatever you want. Hmm, that's a good thought, said the thieves. Come along. We shall see what you can do. When they came to the parson's house, Tom slipped through the window bars into the room, and then called out as loud as he could bawl, Will you have all that is here? At this the thieves were frightened, and said, Softly, softly, speak low, that you may not awaken anybody. But Tom seemed as if he did not understand them, and bawled out again, How much will you have? Shall I throw it all out? Now the cook lay in the next room, and hearing a noise, she raised herself up in her bed and listened. Meantime the thieves were frightened, and ran off a little way. But at last they plucked up their hearts, and said, This little urchin is only trying to make fools of us. So they came back, and whispered softly to him, saying, Now let us have no more of your roguish jokes, but throw us out some of the money. Then Tom called out as loud as he could, Very well, hold your hands, here it comes. The cook heard this quite plain, so she sprang out of her bed and ran to the open door. The thieves ran off as if a wolf was at their tails, and the maid, having groped about and found nothing, went away for a light. By the time she came back, Tom had slipped off into the barn, and when she looked about and searched every hole and corner and found nobody, she went to bed, thinking she must have been dreaming with her eyes open. The little man crawled about in the hayloft, and at last found a snug place to finish his night's rest in. So he laid himself down, meaning to sleep till daylight, and then find his way home to his father and mother. But, alas, how woefully he was undone! What crosses and sorrows happen to us all in this world! The cook got up early, before daybreak, to feed the cows, and going straight to the hayloft, carried away a large bundle of hay, with the little man in the middle of it, fast asleep. He still, however, slept on, and did not awake till he found himself in the mouth of a cow, for the cook had put the hay into the cow's rick, and the cow had taken Tom up in a mouthful of it. "'Good lack a day,' said he, "'how came I to tumble into the mill?' But he soon found out where he really was, and was forced to have all his wits about him, that he might not get between the cow's teeth, and so be crushed to death. At last down he went into her stomach. "'It is rather dark,' said he. "'They forgot to build windows in this room to let the sun in. A candle would be no bad thing.' Though he made the best of his bad luck, he did not like his quarters at all, and the worst of it was that more and more hay was always coming down, and the space left for him became smaller and smaller. At last he cried out as loud as he could, "'Don't bring me any more hay!' The maid happened to be just then milking the cow, and hearing someone speak, but seeing nobody, and yet being quite sure it was the same voice that she had heard in the night, she was so frightened that she fell off her stool and overset the milk-pail. As soon as she could pick herself up out of the dirt, she ran off as fast as she could to her master, the parson, and said, "'Sir, sir, the cow is talking!' But the parson said, "'Woman, thou art surely mad!' However, he went with her into the cow-house to try and see what was the matter. Scarcely had he set foot on the threshold, when Tom called out, "'Don't bring me any more hay!' Then the parson himself was frightened, and thinking the cow was surely bewitched, told his man to kill her on the spot. So the cow was killed and cut up, and the stomach in which Tom lay was thrown out upon a dunghill. Tom soon set himself to work to get out which was not a very easy task. But at last, just as he had made room to get his head out, fresh ill luck befell him. A hungry wolf sprang out, 
and swallowed up the whole stomach with Tom in it at one gulp, and ran away. Tom, however, was still not disheartened, and thinking the wolf would not dislike having some chat with him as he was going along, he called out, "'My good friend, I can show you a famous treat.' "'Where's that?' said the wolf. "'In such and such a house,' said Tom, describing his own father's house. "'You can crawl through the drain into the kitchen, and then into the pantry, and there you will find cakes, ham, beef, cold chicken, roast pig, apple dumplings, and everything that your heart can wish.' The wolf did not want to be asked twice, so that very night he went to the house and crawled through the drain into the kitchen, and then into the pantry, and ate and drank there to his heart's content. As soon as he had had enough, he wanted to get away, but he had eaten so much that he could not get out by the same way he came in. This was just what Tom had reckoned upon, and now he began to set up a great shout, making all the noise he could. "'Will you be easy?' said the wolf. "'You'll awaken everybody in the house if you make such a clatter.' "'What's that to me?' said the little man. "'You have had your frolic. Now I've a mind to be merry myself.' And he began singing and shouting as loud as he could. The woodman and his wife, being awakened by the noise, peeped through a crack in the door. But when they saw a wolf was there, you may well suppose that they were sadly frightened, and the woodman ran for his axe, and gave his wife a scythe. "'Do you stay behind,' said the woodman, "'and when I have knocked him on the head, you must rip him up with the scythe.' Tom heard all this, and cried out, "'Father! Father! I am here! The wolf has swallowed me!' And his father said, "'Heaven be praised!' We have found our dear child again. And he told his wife not to use the scythe, for fear she should hurt him. Then he aimed a great blow, and struck the wolf on the head, and killed him on the spot. And when he was dead, they cut open his body, and set Tommy free. Ah, said the father, what fears we have had for you. Yes, father, answered he. I have travelled all over the world, I think, in one way or other, since we parted, and now I am very glad to come home and get fresh air again. Why, where have you been? said his father. I have been in a mouse hole, in a snail shell, and down a cow's throat, and in a wolf's belly, and yet here I am again, safe and sound. Well, said they, you are come back, and we will not sell you again for all the riches in the world. Then they hugged and kissed their dear little son, and gave him plenty to eat and drink, for he was very hungry. And then they fetched new clothes for him, for his old clothes had been quite spoiled on his journey. So Master Thumb stayed at home with his father and mother in peace, for though he had been so great a traveller, and had done and seen so many fine things, and was fond enough of telling the whole story, he always agreed that, after all, there's no place like home. End of Tom Thumb It was the middle of winter, when the broad flakes of snow were falling around, that the queen of a country many thousand miles off sat working at her window. The frame of the window was made of fine black ebony, and as she sat looking out upon the snow, she pricked her finger, and three drops of blood fell upon it. Then she gazed thoughtfully upon the red drops that sprinkled the white snow, and said, Would that my little daughter may be as white as that snow, and as red as that blood! and as black as this ebony window-frame. And so the little girl really did grow up. Her skin was as white as snow, her cheeks as rosy as the blood, and her hair as black as ebony, and she was called Snowdrop. But this queen died, and the king soon married another wife, who became queen and was very beautiful, 
but so vain that she could not bear to think that any one could be handsomer than she was. She had a fairy looking-glass to which she used to go, and then she would gaze upon herself in it, and say, Tell me, glass, tell me true, of all the ladies in the land, who is the fairest? Tell me who. And the glass had always answered, Thou, queen, art the fairest in all the land. But Snowdrop grew more and more beautiful, and when she was seven years old she was as bright as the day, and fairer than the queen herself. Then the glass one day answered the queen, when she went to look in it as usual, Thou, queen, art fair, and beauteous to see, but Snowdrop is lovelier far than thee. When she heard this, she turned pale with rage and envy, and called to one of her servants, and said, Take Snowdrop away into the wild wood, that I may never see her any more. Then the servant led her away, but his heart melted when Snowdrop begged him to spare her life, and he said, I will not hurt you, thou pretty child. So he left her by herself and though he thought it most likely that the wild beasts would tear her in pieces, he felt as if a great weight were taken off his heart when he made up his mind not to kill her, but to leave her to her fate, with the chance of someone finding and saving her. Then the poor snowdrop wandered along through the wood in great fear, and the wild beasts roared about her, but none did her any harm. In the evening, she came to a cottage among the woods, and went in to rest, for her little feet would carry her no further. Everything was spruce and neat in the cottage. On the table was spread a white cloth, and there were seven little plates, seven little loaves, and seven little glasses with wine in them, and seven knives and forks laid in order, and by the wall stood seven little beds. As she was very hungry, she picked a little piece of each loaf, and drank a very little wine out of each glass, and after that she thought she would lie down and rest. So she tried all the little beds, but one was too long and another was too short, till at last the seventh suited her, and there she laid herself down and went to sleep. By and by in came the masters of the cottage. Now. They were seven little dwarfs that lived among the mountains, and dug and searched for gold. They lighted up their seven lamps, and saw at once that all was not right. The first said, Who has been sitting on my stool? The second, Who has been eating off my plate? The third, Who has been picking my bread? The fourth, Who has been meddling with my spoon? The fifth, who has been handling my fork? The sixth, who has been cutting with my knife? The seventh, who has been drinking my wine? Then the first looked round and said, Who has been lying on my bed? And the rest came running to him, and everyone cried out that somebody had been upon his bed. But the seventh saw Snowdrop, and called all his brethren to come and see her. Then they cried out with wonder and astonishment, and brought their lamps to look at her, and said, Good heavens, what a lovely child she is! And they were very glad to see her, and took care not to wake her. And the seventh dwarf slept an hour with each of the other dwarfs in turn, till the night was gone. In the morning Snowdrop told them all her story, and they pitied her, and said if she would keep all things in order, and cook and wash and knit and spin for them, she might stay where she was, and they would take good care of her. Then they went out all day long to their work, seeking for gold and silver in the mountains. But Snowdrop was left at home, and they warned her, and said, The queen will soon find out where you are, so take care, and let no one in. But the queen, now that she thought Snowdrop was dead, believed that she must be the handsomest lady in the land, and she went to her glass and said, Tell me, glass, tell me true, of all the ladies in the land, who is fairest, 
tell me who and the glass answered thou queen art the fairest in all this land but over the hills in the greenwood shade where the seven dwarfs their dwelling have made there snowdrop is hiding her head and she is lovelier far o queen than thee then the queen was very much frightened for she knew that the glass always spoke the truth and was sure that the servants had betrayed her and she could not bear to think that any one lived who was more beautiful than she was so she dressed herself up as an old peddler and went away over the hills to the place where the dwarfs dwelt then she knocked at the door and cried fine wares to sell snowdrop looked out the window and said good day good woman what have you to sell good wares fine wares said she laces and bobbins of all colors i will let the old lady in she seems to be a very good sort of body thought snowdrop as she ran down and unbolted the door bless me said the old woman how badly your stays are laced let me lace them up with one of my nice new laces snowdrop did not dream of any mischief so she stood before the old woman but she set to work so nimbly and pulled the lace so tight that snowdrop's breath was stopped and she fell down as if she were dead there's an end to all thy beauty said the spiteful queen and went away home in the evening the seven dwarfs came home and i need not say how grieved they were to see their faithful snowdrop stretched out upon the ground as if she was quite dead however they lifted her up and when they found what ailed her they cut the lace and in a little time she began to breathe and very soon came to life again then they said the old woman was the queen herself take care another time and let no one in while we are away when the queen got home she went straight to her glass and spoke to it as before but to her great grief it still said thou queen art the fairest in all this land but over the hills in the greenwood shade where the seven dwarfs their dwelling have made there snowdrop is hiding her head and she is lovelier far o queen than thee then the blood ran cold in her heart with spite and malice to see that snowdrop still lived and she dressed herself up again but in quite another dress from the one she wore before and took with her a poisoned comb when she reached the dwarf's cottage she knocked at the door and cried fine wares to sell but snowdrop said i dare not let any one in then the queen said only look at my beautiful combs and gave her the poisoned one and it looked so pretty that she took it up and put it into her hair to try it but the moment it touched her head the poison was so powerful that she fell down senseless there you may lie said the queen and went her way but by good luck the dwarfs came in very early that evening and when they saw snowdrop lying on the ground they thought what had happened and soon found the poisoned comb and when they got it away she got well and told them all that had passed and they warned her once more not to open the door to any one meantime the queen went home to her glass and shook with rage when she read the very same answer as before and she said snowdrop shall die if it cost me my life so she went by herself into her chamber and got ready a poisoned apple the outside looked very rosy and tempting but whoever tasted it was sure to die then she dressed herself up as a peasant's wife and travelled over the hills to the dwarf's cottage and knocked at the door but snowdrop put her head out of the window and said i dare not let any one in for the dwarfs have told me not do as you please said the old woman 
but at any rate take this pretty apple. I will give it to you. No, said Snowdrop, I dare not take it. You silly girl, answered the other, what are you afraid of? Do you think it is poisoned? Come, do you eat one part, and I will eat the other. Now the apple was so made up that one side was good, though the other side was poisoned. Then Snowdrop was much tempted to taste, for the apple looked so very nice, and when she saw the old woman eat, she could wait no longer. But she had scarcely put the piece into her mouth when she fell down dead upon the ground. "'This time nothing will save thee,' said the queen, and she went home to her glass, and at last it said, thou queen art the fairest of all the fair and then her wicked heart was glad and as happy as such a heart could be when evening came and the dwarfs had gone home they found snowdrop lying on the ground no breath came from her lips and they were afraid that she was quite dead they lifted her up and combed her hair and washed her face with wine and water but all was in vain, for the little girl seemed quite dead. So they laid her down upon a bier, and all seven watched and bewailed her three whole days, and then they thought they would bury her. But her cheeks were still rosy, and her face looked just as it did while she was alive. So they said, We will never bury her in the cold ground. And they made a coffin of glass, so that they might still look at her, and wrote upon it in golden letters what her name was, and that she was a king's daughter. And the coffin was set among the hills, and one of the dwarfs always sat by it and watched. And the birds of the air came too, and bemoaned Snowdrop. And first of all came an owl, and then a raven, and at last a dove, and sat by her side. And thus Snowdrop lay for a long, long time, and still only looked as though she was asleep, for she was, even now, as white as snow, and as red as blood, and as black as ebony. At last a prince came, and called at the dwarf's house, and he saw Snowdrop, and read what was written in golden letter. Then he offered the dwarfs money, and prayed and besought them to let him take her away. But they said, we will not part with her for all the gold in the world. At last, however, they had pity on him and gave him the coffin. But the moment he lifted it up to carry it home with him, the piece of apple fell from beneath her lips, and Snowdrop awoke and said, Where am I? And the prince said, Thou art quite safe with me. Then he told her all that had happened and said, I love you far better than all the world, so come with me to my father's palace, and you shall be my wife. And Snowdrop consented, and went home with the prince. And everything was got ready with great pomp and splendor for their wedding. To the feast was asked, among the rest, Snowdrop's old enemy, the queen, and as she was dressing herself in fine rich clothes, she looked in the glass and said, "'Tell me, glass, tell me true. Of all the ladies in the land, who is the fairest? Tell me, who?' And the glass answered, "'Thou, lady, art loveliest here, I ween, but lovelier far is the new-made queen.' When she heard this, she started with rage, but her envy and curiosity were so great that she could not help setting out to see the bride. And when she got there, and saw that it was no other than Snowdrop, who, as she thought, had been dead a long while, she choked with rage, and fell down and died. But Snowdrop and the prince lived and reigned happily over that land many, many years, and sometimes they went up into the mountains and paid a visit to the little dwarfs, who had been so kind to Snowdrop in her time of need. End of Snowdrop